Hey there, friends. Welcome to the Being Brown and Bold podcast. I'm your host, Jess Thomas. We are so glad that you're joining us for some really vulnerable and some encouraging conversations about stepping out of our comfort zone, being bold, and taking chances. Today, I am chatting with Riji Raja, founder of Affirmation Darling, a wellness stationery brand built on powerful affirmations. She originally grew up in Kuwait, and after living in Texas, she and her husband moved from Dallas to Los Angeles to pursue acting. With the high cost of living in SoCal, their living situation quickly fell apart, forcing them to downsize from a two bedroom to a one bedroom to an apartment shared with 10 other people before finally living in their car. They were homeless for two years, but thanks to a mission hiring company, they were able to sign a long-term lease in 2019 on a new apartment. This took a toll on their mental well-being, which is the inspiration behind the social impact stationary business project called Affirmation Darling. Her flagship product is Affirm Actions, a box of cards with affirmations and actions for artists and creatives. She advocates for young adults from underserved and disadvantaged communities facing homelessness and mental health issues by donating her stationery for each one sold. So, Riggi, it is so great to have you here today on the podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. So to get started, we really feel like names are important, especially in our culture. Can you share um, your name and how to pronounce it uh, and what it means? Oh, I love that. Okay. Um, so my name is Riggi Raja. Um, but my mom calls me Rigi, so it's really quick, but America loves to extend, so it's Rigi, so I go with all of that. Um, and what is the meaning? So Raja means king, which I assume, assume everybody knows. Rigi is actually derived from Regina, which is my grandmother's name, and Regina means queen. So I just learned like maybe three years ago that that's what it means. So I'm like, wait, this queen and king in my name. So um, I am constantly telling myself to walk in that identity and not to, uh, yeah, not to like, I think it's part of my identity, part of my brand, part of my life. So yeah. That's awesome to like know that you're living as royalty is amazing. Yeah. Royalty, yeah. That's, it. that's the word. <laughs> yeah. Can you share a little bit about your cultural heritage and what it was like for you to live in the Middle East, in India, um, and how that informed your, your life? Yeah. Um, so I was born and raised in Kuwait, and I lived there for 26 years. So that's the better part of my life. And then my husband happened and I moved to the US. Uh, I moved to Dallas in 2014. So I got married in 2013. Um, and then 2014, it was like in six months, I moved to the US. Uh, and then we and then we eventually wanted to leave Dallas and then we moved to LA. But there's a lot of cultures going on here. So my mom and dad are from two different states in India. My mom's from Kerala. My dad's from Tamil Nadu. So there's two different languages, two different cultures. I think we, we can all resonate with that, that we all watch movies in different languages and we understand, but, uh, and we also can speak. And so we're all like struggling with code switching, right? So there's that part of me coming into the US and I'm like, oh my gosh, I have a lot of cultures in me, but how do I neutralize this? Uh, so I had, I came in culture shocked, with this accent and immediately I land and I'm like, oh, I don't think I fit in here anymore. But, you know, being in America or oh, coming to America was my dream. It's, uh, I've always wanted to know what it's like to live the American dream. For those of you who are listening, I'm literally air quoting here, live the American dream. Um, and so I come in and I'm like going through life and I realized, wait, this is not what I'm seeing in movies. You know, this is not, this is real. Everything else that's portrayed on TV is not real. Uh, so there's this Middle Eastern culture, then there's my mom's culture, and then there's my dad's culture, and then coming to the US, uh, getting married to my husband, who is from my mom's side, which is from Kerala. Um, and yeah, it's been pretty interesting. And I think I'm still trying to, wrap my head around uh, this life that I'm living in the U.S., but aren't we all? Agreed, agreed, yeah. So did you grow up speaking English or Tamil or Malayalam? What did you grow up speaking? Everything. Everything. 
all of them all at once uh, there's that movie every everything everywhere all at once like yeah <laughs> that, that's what I, that's what i've been doing and i still do that um so my dad speaks tamil right and my mom speaks malayalam um the the, in, the funny thing is that it's really amusing to watch but they both have so much ego and they don't both in a good way it's a funny ego it's not like um the other kind of ego like i'll only speak in tamil and i'll only speak in malayalam and then i'm like i it's translating in my it's subconscious now right and so i end up responding in malayalam sometimes i respond in tamil and if i'm on vis visiting my dad's side and speaking in tamil so i'm constantly having to switch languages and then recently we started, not recently but i've watched indian movies a lot and i started watching telugu movies and i now i expose my husband to that as well he's like this is a lot for me to process because he doesn't know tamil he knows only malayalam um and he grew up watching the classic malayalam movies and so here i am like come sit with me and watch this telugu movie as like subtitles please i was like okay uh so i when i was uh, i studied in india i did my bachelor's and masters in india and so uh fortunately my roommates were all telugu so here i am now learning that language as well but i still need subtitles but i i do understand a little bit um so there's that so that language as well and then in kuwait arabic was a must so that was also added to my plate and then i was tired of hindi by ninth grade and i switched to french because i was like i and i that is even that is my thing where i just get bored really fast and i want to learn something i'm such a nerd so i geek out so i was like i don't want to learn hindi anymore i've learned enough um and i don't like my teacher anymore and so i'm going to switch to french uh and so i learned french for two years and when we went for our honeymoon to uh paris uh i was able to understand everything there not the people speaking but the signs and the menu and my husband was like thank god i married somebody who studied french i was like you are lucky uh but yeah th there's a lot going on but i'm so so proud of uh, where i come from and what i have in me that's amazing i'm always fascinated when people know so many languages and my family came from kerala the year before i was born and in the beginning they taught me all malayalam but then by the time i was like two they were like wait a minute we're going to stay in america she should know english so they stopped speaking to me in malayalam and only english and i all i did was watch public television with all of like the kid shows like sesame street electric company mr rogers so i could just learn english so i didn't learn malayalam um we watched some hindi movies and malayalam movies but i didn't like pick it up and i feel so sad that i'm like oh no that prime opportunity when you're younger to learn things i i lost it so oh, um, you can always learn it now it's not too late I don't think I we'll could ever... but I'm old now so it takes a lot more effort <laughs> to do it. Everyone we're actually talking to a granny here. No, just stop. <laughs> stop. You're not old. I'm 51. I'm old. You're not old. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. There's no age system in my dictionary in my uh, You're right. I mean, I'm not old. I have like like my parents are 80. They're starting to get old now, but they're like starting to get old. <laughs> Yeah, I love that. See? You yeah. are like a long way from there. But as far as my brain learning stuff, I definitely notice <laughs> a shift. Um, when you were little, what did you imagine your life would be like as an adult? Oh. I don't think I imagined a life that I wanted, but I definitely wanted freedom for my family. <laughs> So there's two different cultures, right? There's restri uh, restrictions and labels, and so I'm like, I don't want to live the life that they want me to live. So I was on this mission to rebel against them and live life on my own terms, but I don't know what that meant. Mm -hmm. And so I was experimenting, like figuring out who I am, what I love, what I wanted, and uh, even now when I think about like where did my habit for journaling come from? And I remember when I was a kid, I used to. write a lot i would write my wishes and i was not even a believer then and i was like i don't know who i'm writing to what i'm writing to i grew up catholic um and i did not resonate with that at all it was it just felt like a set of rules for me um uh, until i discovered god like first on a personal level like later but until then i was like here's my dreams who is listening can you make this happen um uh, and i still remember it's so stupid but i actually wrote down i wanted to be a supermodel <laughs> 
yeah no uh that i don't know why i think now that i am an adult and i'm like why did i write that it's interesting what the things that we go uh, things that we thought about back then it might seem silly but there was a root reason as to why and i realized that um it was not because i wanted to be a supermodel like even today there's no way i'll be a supermodel trust me who is listening no don't even look me up uh I think the reason for me to want that was that when I uh, when when I was exposed to media, which is newspaper, which is my favorite, um, I used to read a lot, and I would just see supermodel pictures, and I was like, look, I love their life, their glitz and glam and everything, and so I, I was like, I want to be. I didn't know the words then, right? I don't know why I wanted. Today, I can. I know what I was trying to articulate. I was like, I just want to be seen and heard. I just want to be. I want to I want to have a sense of belonging out there. I don't want to be just in the four walls of this house. So being a supermodel means being a super person, you know, like I will be able to have a lot of friends. I'll I'm able to be able I'll be able to do what I want in life, pursue my dreams and all that. Um, so today I am chasing my dreams, God's desires for my heart. Uh, but it all comes from that little thing back then and I still remember I wrote it with an orange pen in this ruled paper my mom saw that and she was like what is this nonsense and she tore it up so I don't have that paper with me uh, to treasure uh but I don't remember anything else on that paper but I know that I wrote like 15 to 20 things I wanted but that's the only one I still remember that's etched in my memory that I wanted to be a supermodel uh, I don't, yeah, but again, it's just to reiterate, I do not want to be a sober model. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, and even, you know, wanting to be seen, but then also wanting to be loved. And it may seem like, oh, I want people to look at me, but it's not look at me, but, but to see me and love me for who I am. Yeah. 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 I totally yeah. resonate with that. Um, I remember when I was a kid, my thing is I drew I wanted to be an architect. So I drew like plans for my house, but uh -huh. why did I want to do that? Because I'm actually terrible with design and aesthetics. Um, and so I don't know if it's like utilitarian, like I want everything to be functional. So mm -hmm. my house on paper was huge because I had a room for everything that I wanted to do right. and that didn't work out. So then I wanted to be an airline stewardess because I wanted to see the world and fly everywhere. Smart. And then I was too short. They had a rule back then. You had to be tall to reach the overhead compartment. And I'm only oh. five feet tall. I've been five feet tall since sixth grade. And so <laughs> couldn't do that. Um, and then I wanted to, I, I was addicted to TV because I was watching it all the time. That's how I learned English. And then I was like, I want to write commercials. Back in the 1980s, um, there was jingles for all these commercials and I thought it was so fun. I'm like, that's what I want to do. So that's what I ended up starting and going to college for. And I ended up doing that either. Not quite. I ended up doing like marketing ish things, but it's right. interesting when we grow up, what, what are we're thinking, right? Like we may say we want this, but like you were saying, what's the heart behind it and what yeah. do we really want? When you said that, like another, it's, it's funny, like, because we were talking, like, it's triggering a lot of memories that I suppressed. Uh, I remember, and then when I, obviously, I can be a supermodel with uh, an Indian family, in, around the Indian family, right? Um, I wanted to be a NASA scientist. And my, my, I, my mom would tell everyone, like, she wants to be a scientist. And the people who are listening on the receiving end, they're, like, laughing. And they're, like, that's not possible for us, for us to be be that i'm like why not you know i wanted i want to be that and um i remember i would everyone would go to sleep and i would take my binoculars and then uh binoculars still working on my accent sorry um and i would go to the balcony and like read the lines on the moon and like just figure out how it's you know the how the moon looks like i was so fascinated and again it what now that i'm thinking about it, like it's not because i wanted to be a scientist again i wanted to be on top of the world and feel again, loved, seen, heard, and be like, I want to have access that my family is not letting me have access to. And I want to reach dreams and go after uh, visions that people say I can't. So there was, again, the rebellious nature, there was a streak in me. I wanted to do things that someone would tell me, no, that's not possible for you. Uh, and I think I'm still doing that because I got mm -hmm. a lot of 
a lot of like naysayers, a lot of, you know, conversations over me that I don't think we should, you should do what you're doing right now. I was like, oh, okay. So you think this is uh, impossible? Okay, I'm going to do it. Uh, because honestly, I serve a God, a living God who actually says, you know, when you believe it, believe like you've received it, ask and you should receive. Um, anything you ask in my name, think, think that it's possible. So I'm like, if he said that, who are you? Why, why do you think you have an opinion over my life? Um, so that's my, my motto when, you, when, I, when I live my life and make my decisions. Right. So then when it came to your career, did you have any difficulties in like, this is going to be the vocational path that I'm going to go towards? Oh, uh, no, I have, I had no plan. Uh, I just wanted, I think, so when I came to the U.S., um, I was on a transfer visa. So I was working in a company in Kuwait called KPMG. Um, I was an auditor and then I moved to Dallas as an auditor. And then I realized that I don't want to be an auditor. This is like, of course, like I whole, I planned my whole thing on a, on a, you know, on the book, uh, sorry, in a book, like I want to get my CPA and my certification. And like, I want to start, have my own agency, but as it kept going, uh, as like time started going by, which is only two years, but it was torture. It was agonizing working that job. It was um, like 8, 8 a.m. to 2 a.m. That was my work schedule, especially from January wow. to April. Um, so it was like the, you know, the, the book closing time for most companies in the year end. So this is what the timing was. And I was like, this is not what God made me come to the U.S. for. Like, this is not what I want to do. Um, and so I didn't know what, I don't know what was after that, right? If I want to quit, what's waiting on the other side? What do I do? So he's just, this is confused, you know, 26 year old, like trying to figure out, okay, I've learned all of this. I've gathered all of this knowledge and my bachelor's and master's, but I don't want any of it anymore. So where do I go from here? Um, so I think I was asking that I'm confused. And then I was one night like watching Oscars, um, at home, at home with my husband. And I was like, why isn't there anyone who looked like us? You know, like, I wonder if we should go act, you know? Uh, so but I wanted to sing. So I used to be in the worship band back in Kuwait. So that was the op door that opened for me, uh, when it came to making a decision as to the route that I want to go. Um, I was looking up singing opportunities in the U.S., like American Idol and all that. I didn't do any of that, by the way. Um, I almost almost got, I, I did get signed to a, this music label and then uh, found out that was a scam. Oh, no. <laughs> funny. Uh, I think I... I don't think I lost much money, uh, but I was so naive and stupid and young and I didn't know what, um, how this could happen. Like, you know, so no one like warned me anything. But um, anyway, so I was like, I don't want to like, again, there's that hurt. I'm like, I don't want to sing anymore. And then it was like, kind of like, a, uh, it's like a lab, a creative lab kind of thing. And they were like, hey, why, here's a monologue. Can you do this? And I did it. And they're like, you can act too. Why don't you add that to your uh, uh, your mission of learning new things? I was like, okay. That After that was when I watched, os watched Oscars. And I was like, oh, I actually want to do this. Again, that supermodel thing comes in, that red carpet. And I was like, what if I can change the world being, you know, one unique brown face on the red carpet and do good things. Again, always I check my heart. Like, do I want fame or do I want to use that fame? Uh, for me, even today, I always self-check. Like, it's not that the fame, it, it starts with the fame, obviously, the platform, right? I know it sounds really annoying if anyone's hearing this, but fame, oh, look at her. No, 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 let me get there. Uh, you need a platform for your voice to be heard. For that, you need fame. Fame doesn't mean just, you know, again, like I said in the beginning, glam and glitz and money. No, fame means you just have to be popular. You just have to be someone sought after. You just have to be someone famous, right? That's when people listen to you. People respect you. People pay attention to you. And that was what I was chasing after because I wanted to convert that platform to share the message which, and I was like, okay, now, and then when I'm having this thought, I'm like, okay, what message do I have? I don't have anything. And then boom, like I had to go through the adversity that I had to go through. And God's like, there you go. That's the message you were looking for, asking for. 
now I have a message. And now this is why like I am even in front of you, the honor of being, you know, podcasted by you. Uh, because I have this this story that God gave me and God's like, you can go through this. I want you to know now that you come out of it, can you please share it? You know? Um, I think I digress, but uh, but yeah, please help me come back to the thought oh, of what that was. No, no, no. No, that's really good because it's like you had this vocational path based on your education, but your heart has wasn't really into it. So do you feel like when you were growing up, you didn't fit in because your dreams and your, your desires and aspirations were different from maybe your classmates or your family? Because you seem like, like a diamond in the rough growing up. Uh, I don't think I grew up with any, like there weren't friends or anything that inspired me to explore what's on the other side. It was, I honestly don't know. I think everyone was giving this cookie cutter life and answer. I'm like, oh, I don't like this. You know, if they say peanut butter has to be on bread, but I'm like, why don't I put peanut butter on saltine crackers? You know, I'm always like, well, but can I do this differently? Can I get the same result, but doing it different? So I always... I get bored, like I said, so I don't want to copy what the world's doing, which I love that even God says, do not copy the world's behavior. And so I'm like, okay, I want to do it some differently, you know? Um, and so I think I'm always looking for something creative, unique. And I, uh, I like when things stand out. I like when the methods or the strategies stand out. Um, I like when someone has not tapped it yet and I'm like, oh, I'm onto something. Um, and so I think I, for the most part of my life till I got married, I did everything what my family wanted me to do. Again, there was rebelliousness. They wanted me to become a dentist and they were literally at this college trying to sign up for the admission. And then they called me like, are you sure you want this? And I was like, no. My dad flew to India to get the admission for me. And I was in Kuwait. Kuwait. I said, no, I don't want it anymore. And and they're like, thank God, she said no. But in then they were torn. But now they're like, oh, there's no way you would have pursued that. And I'm like, I don't want to look down people's mouth. I'm sorry, but uh, respect to all dentists. But I hate sitting in the dentist chair. I'm like, I can't sit. So how am I going to look at someone's to a teeth? Um, and so I did my uh, I did my bachelor's in microbiology, and I was like, oh, that's not something anyone chooses. I'm going to do something different again stupid rebellious behavior there uh but i loved it and then i was like i want to get phd and then a boyfriend happened in my life and then he convinced me to pursue masters in business and so i was like oh my gosh what am i doing with my life but i i think i prioritized him over my life and that i regret and then i ended up doing my masters in business but now then i after that i came back to kuwait i got my job at kpmg it's one of the big four auditing firms in the world. And so I still remember I wrote down on a piece of paper, like I want to get into one of these four, one of the big fours. Uh, and my dad would carry it in his pocket and like always like pray that I do get into one and I got it. Uh, and that was the reason why, you know, everything, like even if something negative happens, I always see some, always, always, always see something positive come out of it, the beauty from the ashes. So that's the reason why I was able to come to, uh, to the U.S. Even though I married my husband, who is a citizen, um, I did not come through his, you know, the, legally through him. I came through the job. Um, so it all turned around. I think where I'm right now is where God, not I think, I believe where I am right now is where exactly God wants me to be or else he wouldn't have let that series of events happen in my life. Uh, so yeah, I'm always pursuing everything different. I don't want to do what my neighbor is doing. So. I, so the podcast is called Being Brown and Bold, and it sounds like you've made a lot of bold choices, but also being brown, a lot of our cultural background is honoring our family and family comes first. And a lot of people struggle with that, with their honoring their parents, honoring their family, especially when we're driving towards our dreams, whether it's vocationally or where we want to live or whatever it is. I even think about like my own parents, like they didn't do the normal thing of staying in Kerala and being with their family. They went to Calcutta and they pursued education and then they left the country mm -hmm. and, you know, hardly saw their parents again, but it was definitely a struggle for them how to honor their parents. Do you feel like you also had that same struggle as you were pursuing your dreams? 
Yes, absolutely. Yes. Uh, so here's my parents who come with the background of intercultural marriage, right? They don't want to see that happen to their children. So I'm like, that's so selfish that you can't, like you get to enjoy life and be rebellious. I can't have that. I hope you know that's where I inherited the rebellious streak from. And so uh, when I married my husband, uh, the same issues, his family did not like that I was half Tamil. And so they completely shunned him, like kicked him out of the family and all that. So I'm like, at this point, I'm like so used to hearing no to anything that I want, right? Um, but just going back to my family and how I struggled getting their approval, I came to, again, this at this point where I'm like, you know what, I don't care what you, what you both think. I'm just, still, I'm gonna go after it. Um, and I think I also picked up a pattern with them. They were like, there's no point in telling this thick skull of hers, like, you know, that, we have they, I we want her to do something that we want her to do so just let her do what she wants she'll learn her lesson and then she'll come back like the prodigal son and then we'll we'll be like I told you and so there has been a lot of I told you this would happen but I don't regret it and I tell my mom uh when she was visiting actually uh, last year uh for holidays I told her I brought up a lot of conversations and I told her like there was a few things that I wish you did and she was upset, but I told her to take it in the right sense. Like, I wish you let us let us kids do what we wanted rather than trying to restrict us. Because when you say no, our subconscious mind is not listening to the no. If you say, don't do it, in my head, it's like, do it, you know? It doesn't process don't. And so you just let us do what we wanted to do. Give us, give us the instructions, not like, you know, go do whatever you want and do all the wrong things in life, no. Give us the instructions and tell us in a gentle, nurturing way rather than I'm going to punish you. I'm going to beat you with the belt. I'm going to like lock you in the room for an hour and make you learn your lesson. Like that doesn't really work. That discipline doesn't work at all. So because I grew up in that strict culture of, you know, disciplining is the way to go. I was like, I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to show you how that I don't need your help. And I'm going to do exactly the opposite of what you're asking me to do. Um, but again, I was, I think I did honor my own self as well. I was definitely on a self-discovery path as well. Uh, again, a young teenage girl and I'm uh, like, oh, what is it like to have a relationship? What's it like to date? There's no social media. It's just literally watching Legally Blonde or like uh, all those rom-com rom movies. So I'm like, oh, I want a taste of that. Like, I want to know what it's like. Uh, but I just saw myself as this really ugly, dark skinned girl. Uh, and I was like, I don't think I'm cut out for love life. And so here I am like trying, like, I'm going to force myself to get out there and speak with a lot of guys. And then my mom's like, why are you speaking with boys? Like I put you in a girl's school. Like, why do you have friends for boys numbers on like, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to collect more guy numbers from guys. And I'm going to have a lot of guy friends. I would go to tuitions like, uh, you know, back in, in the Middle East or in India, I'm sure we all took extra tutoring for uh, subjects that we were not good at. So my mom sent me tuitions. I was like, yeah, guys, I get to know, you know, the others, uh, the, that gender now um and so i think i naturally there was that streak in me that i just don't want to fit the cookie cutter uh model of what a culture tells us to do um i don't think i learned to become rebellious like i said it just i feel like i was born with it <laughs> yeah it might be your enneagram <laughs> it is actually actually my enneagram is three i'm an influencer and so i like to influence my decisions See? <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't like i'm like except for my parents like i don't want you people to influence my decisions but um yeah i i that is a part of me i was born with it i'm sure yeah thank you for sharing all that yeah i, I feel like a lot of that story resonates with a lot of brown people um it was really bold of you one to like me, your husband, and both of you decide to get married, especially without his family's um, approval. I mean, that, that feels like beyond approval. Um, how has that been for you all? Because again, brown culture is like, you don't just marry the person, you marry the family. But obviously, that couldn't really happen in your situation. Um, so, uh, sorry, I'm trying to rephrase the answer also in my head. So you were asking if uh, how it is without his family? Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
Um, so I'll pick up the answer from there. <laughs> I can um, so living without his family on our side, I think is a blessing. I'm sorry to say, but just watching all those Malala movies, like Indian movies where the in-laws are so strict. I'm like, oh, I am so glad we don't have in-laws on our side. And my husband's like, you're welcome. He's really cool, by the way. Like he's so chill. He's like, as long as you're happy, I don't care what, what is happening in our life. Like that's all that matters. So, and he keeps like, it's scare tactics, by the way. He's like, uh, if you, if you were now, if my dad was talking with you right now, I don't think you'll be smiling 24 seven. I was like, oh, okay, then I'm glad. So he's also kind of like discreetly glad that his family is not in the picture as of now. I mean, we, we really pray that that changes. Um, but from what his family believes, like, you know, how they're so conservative or how they don't want me in my husband's life. I'm like, I don't think I want to be on people, negative people like that, because that's going to affect our trajectory that's it's going to be like a roadblock in our life too and i keep telling mel my husband uh his name is melvin uh, melween uh, uh i keep telling mel like i don't think you'll be pursuing what you're pursuing like screenwriting acting and just really doing his thing i don't think his family would approve at all and so he never dreamt he would be pursuing this life that he's pursuing, right? It, he's like, I've never even ventured into creativity. It's more like, oh, a medical field. He was a physical therapist assistant. He's like, this is my life. I'm going to do a PhD, which he went through one semester and then he dropped out of it. And again, he was like, I'm doing this all for my family. And then you come along and you're like, He's like, you're such a disruptor. And I was like, I like that title. I like that label. I love disrupting things. I love disrupting and just like, uh, not making things normal, you know, I don't want to do that. And so right now at the moment, uh, as we pursue and figure out where we are headed and when it comes to our destiny, I'm glad that his family is not in the picture. And then my family did try to, you know, give their input as always, but I'm like, I'm sorry. Thank you for being in my life when you, when I needed you right now, I still need you to support me but not give your opinion. And so it's just, I just want you to be on the sidelines on the bleachers and just support me and cheer me. Um, mm -hmm. I think that they finally got it. Now they don't have any opinion. Now they're more like, how's that audition? Um, how's that? How did you, how's the sales going? How's your job going? I was like, wow, um, I, this happened actually a few months ago, the transition. So uh, I'm 35 now. And so it's like all, everything after everything that's happened and after like it, took them like 35th year of my life now to say, okay, we support you. We're not going to cross question what you're going after. So it took time. So I'm like, let me handle my family. I think your family is a lot of work. Uh, we'll get there when we get there. It's really cool to hear that redemption story happening. And like, it's almost like they've come to respect, like they don't agree with you, but we respect you. And we trust you that you can handle things. And even though you're their daughter, they don't have to parent you. Exactly. I think there's also a trust factor. And they've noticed that I've been able to be independently uh, achieving things, even though they thought, you know, let's say I was going down, you know, chasing A and they're like, don't do it. Like go after B. And then I prove that no, see, A works out for in my favor. They're like, oh, okay. And so they need, you know, it's, it's, it's normal. Our parents need evidence. They need proof that it'll actually work in your favor. And for them, it's more of our, our culture is more about uh, like the physical proof of success and not just mental proof. And here we are chasing mental wellness and mental health. And they're like, I don't care if you're stressed, like you need to make sure you don't take a sick, a sick leave at your job. And even like when I was working KPMJ, I'd be like, uh, today I'm like, I'm not feeling well. So I took off. Like, you took off what will they think of that what, will, won't they fire you i'm like can i not take a, a day off because i'm sick so that's again that fear there's so much there's that upbringing in our in our culture of fear everything's rooted in fear and that's something that i'm still working on but as long as as long as we live in that fear i don't think we can ever achieve anything in life especially when it's ingrained with that culture where we are afraid, what will our family say? What will our family think? What would the society think to say about this? But um, I think I also have to admit that being in the U.S. gives me the freedom to behave the way I'm behaving. 
I don't know if I could do this in India. Like I want to be, I want to be transparent and like admit that I, we could all ha be having the privilege of uh, living this life, uh, you know, on our own terms in the U.S. Maybe it's difficult in India, and I'm sure it's difficult. I know my cousins; they are not living the life that they want. So, living living in this country has its benefits. So, I guess then you could say you are living the dream life because you have no one to stop you. So, right, that you can pursue things or at least try it out. Um, I think part of your story that I think is great is how there are these stigmas out there, stigma with uh, seeking help or even taking care of your mental health, stigma with homelessness and stigma with um, like pursuing, you know, this Bollywood, Hollywood uh, going and like, you know, that's for other people. I think brown people think that that's for other people, but we have these career paths that are safe and dependable yeah. because security is what's most important. And I feel like you took all those and said, never mind all the <laughs> I disrupt the formula. I don't believe in security and success. I mean, I believe in success and security, of course, uh, but I don't believe pursuing that in the traditional form. I want to make sure that as I'm pursuing for those things, that I'm still happy along the way, that I'm mentally sane and stable first in my head before and in my heart before in the physical form and so to say to admit that i know i uh, i didn't mention it out loud but i was homeless and i lived in my car for two years even in those two years even my mental health was so bad deteriorate it was deteriorating from day one um but once i understood that this is what god wants me to go through i think it was easier for me to just throw it on god i was like you know what he wants me to be homeless fine i'll accept it and like but that was a switch in my mind and i was like i'm gonna accept this but not gonna accept the reality but this is a bridge that i have to cross but my mental health changed and so here i am like hey i'm actually happy i'm fine living in my car that honestly was the path that got me ready to get out of homelessness. You know, I was, I stopped fighting against it, but I, I'm also like, my family still asks me, why didn't you tell us? I'm like, I don't think one, I don't think you'll be able to handle it. Two, you wouldn't be able to afford us, especially living in LA. So think about two years. You, I don't think you could have been, you could afford paying for two, you know, two years worth of rent and making sure we have a life here. And then also we have to be answerable to you. And then we have to quit our dreams. I'm like, you know what? I know you're going to say, I told you so. So I don't want to hear that. I'm just going to go through this. And I want to prove to myself that I can overcome this. And so now I always use my homelessness story as a benchmark. And any, anytime I go through something, I'm, like, I'm all, always telling myself, if I can get through that, I can get through this. This is, this is just a blip. Um, so from that journey, that was when my the eyes of my mind opened uh, and I realized mental health is so, so important. And that's not something that's taught in our culture. And so when my parents came this time, I told them like, please prioritize mental health. I know you, we don't use the words mental health, but you do, we do use it in different forms. But I remember when my mom, I told my mom like, hey, I remember when you told me when I was a child, when I said, I'm stressed. And they were like, you said that as a child, why do you stress? You don't, what do you know about stress? Like, I don't, I think even a five-year-old would stress, okay? Stress happens at any age. There's no, I mean, there's no age, you know, uh, for that. I think my, again, they were brought up in that way, like stress happens only after marriage when you take care of your family. Like, no. And so I told her, please don't say that. I mean, I know you're not going to have your kids anymore, but just tell the world that you can't, you know, tell, you can't say that. Don't stress. And so, um when we became homeless, um, here I am handling a husband who wants to end his life very creatively. I actually have to give it give it to him. So came up with five creative ways to end his life. I was like, oh my gosh, I just, I mean, my family doesn't know. Your family, we lost. I can't lose you too, because then it, it's going to come back. I'm going to be the laughing stock. And that, you know, like I forced you into marriage now. And then after that, it's going to be like, I end, I'm the reason that you ended your life please don't do this to me. I'm being selfish here, but please protect me. And so he was like, okay, what, what, what other options do we have? I'm like, well, we have the option of just staying positive. And so that's how I started getting on this. I got on this journey of like, I'm going to force myself to think positive thoughts because for one, I don't have a choice. 
um, to what do I have to lose, you know? And so I forced myself to think positive thoughts and I would like ask my husband, okay, good morning. I know it's not a good morning, but give me a negative thought for the day and I will write it down. I would write it into a positive thought. And I'm like, can you just repeat this to yourself? And I'm going to get some actions behind it. And so again, words, uh, actions speak louder than words. And I hate those affirmations. I'm sorry. When they, when they say I am worthy and like, or I am happy right here, right now. That was the affirmation I saw while in the car. And I was like, uh, close your eyes and say that 50 times or whatever. I'm like opening my eyes. I'm like, I'm still in my car. Nothing has changed. I am still not happy. Why are these folks not telling us that you need to pair actions with it? What can I do to get happy? So put, putting actions in behind those words is so powerful. Uh, faith without actions also is dead. So I like combine it like, you know, action is more powerful than words and like faith without action is dead. So I need to put the words on paper for me to, for this is my personal thing. I have to see it, I have to visualize it. And then I have to be like, what do I need to do? D-O to get to that positive thought. And then I need to believe in myself that I can do it. I need to have that blind faith that I can make that happen. And I, that was my, literally to me, that was my secret to getting out of homelessness and my faith and my patience. Oh my gosh, there's a lot of patience in play here. And, um, and just, yeah, just believing the words that I'm telling myself. So that's why it was so important for us to not speak anything negative or our lives. I would literally like every day, I'm like I speak life into this dry bones of homelessness. I speak life into this roof that I'm going to have over my head. And I would have physical things like a blank key and I would let just hang it on my, like in my rear view mirror in the car. I'm like, that's going to be the key to our home. It's blank key by the way, right? That's the key to our home. I'm like, God, I have hung that key. You better manifest a home for us so I can use that key as a door key. Um, so we've done a lot of those things. It was so fun to see God like manifest. Like he was like, you have a lot of faith. Let me bless you. Let me reward you. And I've seen God come through so many times like that. So the more examples of um, the more evidence that I got from God, evidence is important. Like I said, right. Uh, the more evidence I got even from God, the more I started believing that this is supposed to happen. And I know, I know God will get us out of this. Um, and so I, that's also when my faith was tested and it just kept growing, growing, growing. Now I'm rebellious not to leave my faith, you know, no matter what, because in LA, there's all kinds of faith that you're exposed to, but thank God for my rebellious streak. And I'm like, uh, -uh, I am not going to move away from the faith that got me out of my situation. That's how much I love the way God took care of me. I don't want to abandon that. Um, Yeah. I think I digressed again. This is very typical of me, by the way. <laughs> no, this is great. So like the homeless situation in cities around the U.S. just feels so big. Yet those who have never experienced that, it, they really don't understand what that is like. And they have so many questions. What would you say to people who are confused why it's so complicated and there's just not like this simple solution. All you have to do is blank and then you don't have to be homeless. Yeah. So when, before I became homeless, I came to the U S and I, when I'm seeing camps or just homeless community, immediately what crossed my mind, Oh, for God forbid that I even thought those things. Um, I immediately thought, Oh, that they're drug addicts or they are domestic violence, or they're just bad people, and that's why they got homeless. I hate myself for thinking that, because that was so wrong of me, and that is so wrong for anyone to think like that. Homelessness can happen, now that I've gone through it, it really takes someone to go through it, to really look into it, and be like, oh, if this happened to me, I'm this this can happen to anyone, but why did it happen to me? For us, personally, it was because the cost of living in LA was so high, we just couldn't afford it. In LA, it's outrageously, ridiculously high rent here. And so I was also against stubborn that I didn't want to leave LA and go back to Texas. I was like, no, I want to make this work for me. And I'm so glad I did it. Um, but I've come across a lot of people who that is the only reason. They, it was just affordable housing that was not, that was not available for them. Um, that's one of the reasons. And then I've had people just, uh, we've had people just, 
look at us when we tell them our their our story they're like oh like um maybe did you guys like have any drug issues that's that was my wake up call right that's when i was like this is really bad i'm so heartbroken that people think when you're homeless that that's the reason why we could be homeless i'm like there's no drug issues domestic violence my husband's like standing right here in front next to me the, do we look like we're beating each other up no, it's just as simple as we don't have the money to afford this. And so it can happen to any of us in the sense, if let's say a natural disaster happens and you did not save up and you maybe you just moved to the US recently and you never got to save up and then earthquake or something really disastrous happens, you could be homeless too. And then you're going to, that's when you be like, oh, wait, I'm homeless, but I just didn't realize homelessness. This is also homelessness, right? Uh, my parents are so interesting. I always correct them. They're like, you were not homeless. You were in your car. I was like, homeless means you don't have a home. Uh, and then my dad's like, I was also, now that he, he's accepted my story, my dad's like, I was also homeless. I'm like, excuse me, what? You are not homeless. I'm like, yeah, I was moving from my your cousin, like uncle's place to, the, you know, different, different places. I'm like, I mean, yes, you don't have a home, but you're not homeless. You still had a roof over your head. Homeless means you don't have a roof over your head. Um, and so there's these different understandings and different teachings, I guess, you know, of what homelessness means. Um, but the things that we can do for those of us who can't comprehend or those of us who naturally are angry that this is happening and we're also confused, like, what do we do? I can't just, you know, share a post on Instagram and be like, done with it. No, you can't do that. But it's as simple as calling your local officials and, you know, advocating for policy changes, um, donating money or time to local organizations who are already doing the work. And so that this is where, like, when I launched my small business, I didn't want it to make focus on profits. I didn't want to focus on the sales or customers. I mean, yes, that's a focus. But for me, again, my priority is always I want to build a platform and use uh convert that into getting the message across so our small business brand it's a social impact model so we do a buy one give one so when you buy one we donate one so we um i have now donated about six seven hundred uh the decks of our affirmation cards to homeless young adults um recently i've started now going to um uh i have to get invitation because it is it is pretty tough but uh i go to uh unhoused shelters and speak to the youth and the women there and so this is what i'm focusing on like the brand is just a platform i want to use that you know this the money from the sales i want to put it to giving back and i i know that i went through my story to not just for my personal growth but actually to pay it forward uh, and that I'm 100% sure that's the reason. And so if you hear of a brand or of a small business or of a nonprofit organization who are serving the homeless community, all you have to do is just show up to them, show up for them, donate your money, donate your time. If you have the heart to volunteer, go ahead and do that. I know not all of us want to volunteer and that's totally okay. There are some organizations that my heart doesn't resonate with that. You don't have to feel guilty about that. And if you don't feel uh, like homelessness resonates with you, then just check in yourself and see what do you resonate with? Maybe you resonate with sex trafficking victim. Maybe you resonate with animal shelters. Totally fine, totally fine. As long as whatever you feel like, feel like you're doing good, just show up for that. So easiest way that I also found myself like I love animals I love pets and so my heart like I but I can't get myself to volunteer for dog shelters the reason is because I get so attached and I'm like I can't stand watching the abuse that they've gone through but I asked myself okay you're not willing to go there what can you do then I can actually give my money to them that why don't I do that let them do the work so the same way you know, let us do the work. Let us help you. And you help us help you by uh, giving us your attention, giving us your uh, donations, giving us your uh, time, and then we'll do the work for you. So uh, that's another thing that our culture also like makes us feel very guilty when we don't do good. But there's you can do good in just so many different ways. You Even if that one Instagram post that you want to share, sharing the message, you did your job. I, to me, I feel like you did your job because someone might read it, someone might resonate, someone might take action. So think of like, what can you do to inspire action? How can you show up for your community? How can you show up for a cause that maybe 
your neighbor might not show up for. So, yeah. Your story is so encouraging because even though you have gone through depression, your husband's gone through depression, uh, like you were proactive in taking care of your mental health and then you're paying it forward by helping others take care of their mental health, um, especially in the South Asian community. There had been so much stigma, but it's so cool because now I know at least like personally like five or six South Asian counselors who are making it a point to help people in the South Asian community because it's, um, it's it still feels foreign, but like, oh, there's somebody that looks like me that I can talk to. It's really helped. My own father, actually, he got his uh, degree in marriage and family counseling because for his generation, he's in the 80s. Um, mm. He saw even like the older generation, how they were going through things, but they were going at it alone because I think South Asians are told to like, you know, you have to take care of things. So don't worry about how you're feeling. Just do the things. You and so like, even my father would like help people um, in counseling, pastoral counseling, things like that. So it's great to hear how you just have such a heart for that. And I think that message needs to keep going forward. Um, we are getting close to the end, but based on everything you've gone through, what would you now say to 18 year old Reggie, you know, like now that you have all this wisdom at the ripe old age of 30? I, 35. I don't think I have still have enough wisdom. Uh, I'm still uh, gathering that, like going to the field and like picking my fruits that's ready for harvest. I'm still picking out wisdom. Um, what I would tell my 18 year old is that don't don't quit on your rebellious nature. Like that's what's got you uh, this far. Uh, but and, and have bigger dreams. Don't be afraid to you know dream big and it's okay if an adversity comes through and I think that was one thing that I was not mentally prepared for uh but I lo got a lot of prophetic dreams and visions and I knew that this was going to happen so um I want to tell my 18 year old who was not a believer then like you know just so you know God's going to be with you through every step of the way and don't be afraid just blindly just keep walking forward keep marching forward don't look back um and you, you're going to achieve every dream that you are on it, regardless of what the society or the culture tells you. So yeah, very, very, very simple answer. So if there's a listener that's trying to make a, a decision for a bold move or they're hesitant about making a bold move, what would you like to say to them? I think I would love for whoever is about to take a big decision, something that's out of the normal, I want you to actually write it on a piece of paper, the pros and cons of pursuing that move. If you find yourself writing a lot of pros, more than cons, you're on the right track. I would say go for it. But if you're feeling negative and if you're feeling that also like look at the cons, is it being influenced by your own heart? Then okay, then maybe you need to see if that's really good for you or not. But if your cons are all being influenced by what the society is telling you or dictating to you, then ignore that. So that's how I like, I made the decision, uh, several of the decisions, but again, I decided to uh, pursue acting and I did do the same thing. And I saw my, my pros, pros were definitely heavier than the cons. I was like, okay, I'm going to make a move. Uh, but lo and behold, um, I ended up becoming homeless. I didn't know that was going to happen. Um, so sometimes you, you will, you will, or you might, or you might not, uh, I hope you don't, but you might encounter uh, an adversity that you will have to overcome to get to that place, because whatever adversity, if you look back, that is going to nurture you and prep you for the next step of your destiny, next phase of your life. So for me, I had to go through that to learn who I am and who I was and how to unlearn who I was and get my mind ready. And there's a lot of humility check, a lot, a lot of thought inventory check. And I was like, wow, that I'm glad that I learned so much about me while going through that. So accept that there will be roadblocks. There will be a lot of downs, but the ups are going to be way more. And so writing on a piece of paper and weighing the pros and cons and praying about it pray, ask God for three signs if you have to. Um, and if you have peace in your heart 
and you're like, I'm not afraid. There's no doubt. This is what I want. Go for it. And that's Thank my you so much for sharing all that. Um, we want our listeners to know that uh, Affirmation Darling, that they can get, um, they can check out the products there and that definitely when uh, they purchase anything, you donate uh, yes. the same exact thing to someone who is really needing it that needs yep. to hear like about their identity, that they are loved and they are not alone. And so I love that you do that. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Uh, I'm on, yeah, I'm on Instagram, uh, Affirmation Darling. I'm on, uh, I'm on website is also Affirmation Darling. I'm also going to be coming out with newsletter, which I'm so excited about. And I'm going to share my learnings, my, um, on how to basically develop a darling mindset, which is what I like to call it, a uh, mindset of self-worth, self-love, and how to achieve and manifest the dream life that you want. So sign up on my, uh, on my website, well, which I have to post on it, but uh, please do be on the lookout for that. Yeah, and in our show notes, we'll put the links for all those things. Riji, thank you so much for coming on here and sharing your about your life with us. Thank you for having me. And thank you all for joining us on this episode of Being Brown and Bold. We're so glad that you could join us and we will be right back here next week to drop our next episode. Till then, be wise and be bold. <laughs>